everybody. Welcome to my Shalom Zone. My name is Sherry, and it is my great delight and honor to bring you this grace encounter. Today, I want to share with you a scripture that is so extremely important and yet overlooked so very, very many times because we just, we just take for granted as Christians sometimes the message of the cross. And when we read the scriptures, we are reading it a lot of times to try to get in our five-minute devotion before we rush off to do something else. And we don't take time to allow the Lord to really feed us about what that scripture is saying. So I want to share with you something this morning uh, from the book of Colossians regarding what happened at the cross that changed everything. The scripture tells us to rightly divide the word of truth and the first, primary, most important dividing place is at the cross. So when you read the scriptures, it is vitally important that you ask yourself, did this happen before the cross or after the cross? Because even during Jesus' ministry, before he was crucified and raised from the dead, the things he was talking, it was not new covenant yet it was still under the old covenant yes he was teaching about the kingdom of god he was telling things that were about to be set in place and he was giving people hope but he operated as a prophet under the old covenant but after the resurrection everything is changed we're now under the new covenant of grace and peace that was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 54. Now this scripture that I'm going to share with you today is in line with that and it's important that as believers we get hold of this, not be offended by it, but embrace the truth that it shares with us. I want to read to you Colossians chapter 2 starting at verse 8 and reading through verse 14 and I use the old King James simply because I enjoy the language of it and I love being able to research in my Strong's Concordance. So I'm going to read you what it says and then I'll break it down in everyday English. It says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. In other words, pay attention and don't just get sucked into anything. Check and see if it's really after Christ, after what he did. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh has he, speaking of God, quickened together with him, Jesus, having forgiven you all trespasses. A-L-L -L means all. What God did through Jesus at the cross forgave you all trespasses. Hang on to that. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Now, what ordinances was he speaking about here? The book of Ephesians chapter 2, discussing the same subject, in verse 13 says, Now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes far off, are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who has made both one and broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man making peace, and that he might reconcile both to God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you 
which were far off, and to them that were nigh. So we see that the ordinances were what was contained in commandments. And in the book of Colossians, it talked about the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, nailing it in the cross. Now, I want to give you a little visual aid that's probably going to shock your thinking, but think about this and look at it. Think of this as the cross, and I want you to see these commandments that have been nailed to that cross, okay? I think it's probably a little too dark for you to see the blood and stuff on it, but you get the idea. Those commandments were nailed to the cross in Christ Jesus. Those commandments that were written by the finger of God on tablets of stone, as the scripture says in other places. Now, why? We just read that it was against us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Why would he do that? Well, um... Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24 tells us that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ so that we could be justified by faith. And Romans chapter 4 and verse 15 tells us that that law works wrath. And 1 Corinthians 15 verse 56 tells us that the strength of sin is the law. So if you want sin to keep getting stronger, keep throwing law at it. The Israelis lived under the law for 1,500 years, and none of them could keep it fully. And this, this was where the hang-up was. There's nothing wrong with the commandments. They're holy. They show us the very high standards of God. But where the hitch comes in is that it is impossible for us to keep them. And the curse of the law that's found in the book of Deuteronomy and recorded again in the book of James is that if you fail to keep just one, you're guilty of all. And that, my dear friends, is why we needed a Savior, because none of us could keep it all. Do you remember the story of the rich young ruler when he came to the Lord and, and asked him what he must do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus started listing some commandments to him. And this young fellow says, well, I've kept all that from my youth. And see, that's what law does. It, we water it down to the place in our thinking that we think we're keeping it and we're all good. But when you present that to Jesus, who is grace and truth, made flesh, sent to us to minister grace and truth and the new covenant, he's always going to tell you one thing you lack. And when he pointed out to, to this young man that the one thing he lacked was being able to turn loose of his riches and just go whole hog for God, he didn't love God as much as he thought he did. Under the old covenant, the pressure was on us to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And not one of us has been able to do that because we all reserve love for something else. Jesus was the only one that ever could. And now the new covenant emphasis of love is herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. Do you see? He proved his love for us by giving his son to die for us. So... The, the law is good. We're not against the commandments of God. They had their place. They served their purpose. But as I shared with you earlier, that purpose was to act as a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ so that we could be justified or cleared of guilt, made righteous by faith. See, under the old covenant, you were only made righteous if you could keep the commandments. But under the new covenant, we're made righteous simply because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, why does that take faith? Because sometimes your flesh is going to show out and you don't look righteous. You don't act righteous. But we've been made righteous because of the blood of Jesus. And that's where we have to declare our faith and stand in that truth. We've been justified, which means cleared of guilt made righteous by the blood of the Lamb. And there's a scripture in the book of Acts, chapter 13, that is so powerful, and it set a whole city in an uproar. It's a very simple message that Paul was preaching. And he's sharing with people how that God raised Jesus from the dead. And in verse 37, he says, He whom God raised again saw no corruption, be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him 
all that believe, not all that do, not all that perform, but all that believe are justified, cleared of guilt, and made righteous from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. See, under that law of Moses, if you were guilty, maybe you were caught uh, overeating, continually overeating, being a glutton, you got stoned. If you were caught in adultery, you got stoned. There wasn't time to run and make a sacrifice for that. But under the new covenant, Jesus has already been punished in our place for all of those sins. Does that make the sin okay? No, it does not but it provides grace for us to keep being able to receive grace and to keep growing in grace until we get to the place that that sin no longer has a hold on us. Do you see? By the law is knowledge of sin. So it keeps the sin consciousness in our thinking. And when we're sin conscious, we cannot be Christ conscious. Well, since the scripture tells us to look unto him to be saved and to keep our attention centered on heavenly things, we can't do those at the same time. We can't be sin conscious and Christ conscious at the same time. God wants us Christ conscious. He wants us forgiven conscious. He wants us conscious that we have been made righteous by the blood of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that he was made sin with our sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That is what the new covenant is all about. It's not about our performance. It's about our believing. But the amazing thing is, is when we believe correctly, then our performance is going to come in line with that. And there are so many Christians and my heart just breaks for them because they're, they're so convinced that if they keep throwing commandments at the situation, if they keep nagging their lost family about commandments, that it will change them. Well, it hasn't. They only get worse because throwing commandments at sin is just like throwing kerosene logs on fire. It's just going to erupt and get worse and worse and worse. When God wanted to rescue us from sin, he sent grace and truth in Christ Jesus. Read the first chapter of the Gospel of John. God's undeserved favor, which is what grace is, he wrapped it up and he made his word flesh. And he sent that word to teach us, to show us the heart of God. And the scripture in 2 Corinthians, uh, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9 tells us that God called us not according to our works, but according to his purpose and the grace that he gave us in Christ Jesus before the world began. So no matter what kind of a hold that sin or the threats of the devil may have on somebody, grace has the prior claim because God gave that to us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And when Christians get hold of that and they begin to pray according to that, you're going to find out that the goodness of God has absolutely no problem leading men to repentance. But judgment begins at the house of God. And that's what this is. His verdict, his decision to reign in grace and to let grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. We have to be changed in our thinking. We have to look at this from the new covenant perspective before he can ever use us to save this generation. So with that in our thinking, let us pray. Father, I'm so grateful today for your goodness and for your truth and that there's absolutely nothing impossible with you. So I invite you by the power of your Holy Spirit to just bring forth revelation of this truth that those commandments were taken out of the way. They were nailed to the cross, not because there was anything wrong with them as commandments, but because they could not make us righteous they could not make us holy, and it was impossible for us to keep them. In that sense, they were against us. But thank you, Father, that you sent Jesus to keep them for us, and that when we receive Jesus as our Savior, he comes inside to live and to keep them through us. We praise you for this grace. We receive it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.